Recently, we've seen a lot of scandals in the Catholic Church breaking out. And there's a tradition in the Catholic Church of Marian apparitions, even Marian prophecies that point towards a time of corruption, uh, a time of scandal, a time of moral compromise, a time of doctrinal compromise. And so here to discuss these things with me, especially the Marian apparitions and the prophecies, is Timothy Gordon. He's the author of Catholic Republic. He's done a number of these videos with me. We were talking about uh, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, Vigano. And today we're going to focus back in time and look at some of these Marian apparitions. So, Timothy, welcome back. Thanks again. I Great to, to be with you. I wanted to lead off with a, um, it's sometimes contested, but this goes back to 1884. It's October the 13th, and it's not a Marian apparition, but it sort of sets the stage for us. And it said that in 1884, October 13th, which is the Fatima Day, that Pope Leo XIII, after celebrating Mass, turned pale and collapsed as though he was dead. Those standing nearby rushed to his side. They found him alive, but the pontiff looked frightened. He then recounted having a vision of Satan approaching the throne of God, boasting that he could destroy the church. According to Pope Leo XIII, the Lord reminded him that the church was imperishable. Satan then replied, Give me one century and more power over those who will serve me, and I will destroy it. And so the Lord granted him 100 years. And so this kind of sets the stage for the end of the 1800s, even the 1900s, of a time of great satanic influence. And then, you know, in the I think it was in the 70s, Pope Paul VI said the smoke of Satan has entered the church. And so let's talk yeah. about that. Let's talk about whether these are authentic. And let's talk about um, Our Lady as our mother warning us and protecting us. Yeah, great to be with you again, uh, Dr. Marshall. The interesting thing about that, that tale, sometimes confirmed, sometimes denied about the composition of the St. Michael's Prayer. St. Leo the Thirteenth is that. Oh yeah, why don't you say why don't one? You, why don't you fill in people that that's where we get the Michael prayer, St. Michael prayers? Right. It was. I mean, the timing can't be that controverted because that's the year that that he wrote and released the prayer itself. So again, we should say at the outset, a lot of the things we're talking about today are controverted and fall in like one of three categories. Can be confirmed or on the other extreme, can be denied. A lot of them are in a middle category of, are, are basically worthy of belief, to use the, term, the, the church's term, have been confirmed second or third hand by reliable sources, but we're not sure about. The St. Michael's Prayer falls in that category in terms of uh, its, its ideology, its origin. Pope Leo XIII, imagine this, is saying, a morning mass, uh, basically a private mass for just himself and a few others at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's. He's struck as if dead, like you said, ash and white, takes about 10 minutes and, and witnesses the things you say. Whether you like it or not, A, this happens 33 years to the day before October 13, 1917, which is the miracle of the sun. Right, which is a historical fact. Whether you like it or not, it's a historical fact. B, Leo XIII releases this prayer as a mini exorcism, uh, a, a shorter version of the prayer, said at the end of every Mass, this is removed with bizarre timing right before the release of the new Mass in 1970. It's like 1969. This is dispensed and done away with, which is strange, kind of like the, the oath against modernism was dispensed right in 1968. A lot, so we, we talked last time, Dr. Marshall, about all of the strange untimeliness of these dispensations and or coincidences that are happening between 65 and 70, the close of the council and the release of the new mass. It's very strange. And, but, and I'll interject here that it's it's strange to add anything to the Mass. Technically, the St. Michael prayer wasn't added into the text of the Mass, but it was a, you know, appended to the end of Mass. And for a Pope to declare that that is required at every single Roman Rite Mass in perpetuity, it's a big deal. That's right. Yeah, That's and right. then to something, remove it is also a big deal. It. So, yeah, he, he didn't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to add St. Michael prayer 
to, to vanquish the devil in 1884. It seems that something happened in 1884, 33 years, you know, before Fatima. Right. And there were, there were two reliable cardinals that were still living uh, in the like 1970s or 80s that, that verified that uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it was more like the 50s that verified this um, when I looked into it. Whatever the case is, yeah, it was a large impetus that made Pope Leo the Thirteenth that prompted him on to action to have a mini exorcism at the end of the mass, not altering the mass, but into perpetuity, saying, "We need extra prayers. You know, we need extra guard." Uh, what all of I think today's podcast will be about is the twentieth century and the coming attack on the church from within the church that that Leo the Thirteenth you know, at the end of the 19th century, saw coming and saw fit to warn churchmen about over and over and over again. You know, he published encyclical after encyclical after encyclical about the coming modernist intra-Catholic attack, meaning within the church, on the church. And, you know, call us wackos if you want, this is a game that's been played for about 50 years in the church about stories like the one you told and some of the ones we're going to talk about today. Calls whatever you want, like sticks and stones. But the fact of the matter is, go read Leo XIII's encyclicals. Go read Pius X's encyclical, uh, Pescendi Dominici Gregis. They're talking about an attack that's coming to the church in the 20th century. Within and the as church. We'll, within. The new attack by the modernists they've been trying since the French Revolution was to attack, attack the church from outside. And we, for, for various reasons, you might not want to get all the way into, we have specific knowledge that they had changed tack in the late 19th century. And now the attack was going to come within the church. And Gregory XVI talks about it as far back as like the 1860s. Leo XIII, Pius X are all warning about it. How come, if this is so wacky to talk about, what happened to the church in the late 20th century, mirrored earlier by Marian prophecy, prefigured by Marian prophecy, looked precisely the way that Leo XIII and Pius X and Mary herself said it would look? Yeah. It's strange. The other thing is, is we have pope after pope warning us of these problems, and then the church ends up, into, ends up in a lot of problems. And then now in our time, we hear the hierarchy saying there aren't any problems or the problems are minimal or we're not in a big crisis. Right. It's, it's frustrating. Which, which should be the one undeniable yeah. aspect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you say we're not in a crisis now. It's, it's funny because it's a spectrum, uh, uh, you know, teaching this, being involved in, in webcasting, having any place in the lay apostolate in the church today. You know as well as I do, Dr. Marshall, it's a whole spectrum. There are still the the quicksand head barriers in the church that are even trying to say there's not a crisis to speak of. There aren't ma- there aren't as many of them as there used to be, though, because it's it's become undeniable. The the events of the last month have made it all but undeniable. We we, we can talk in a in a more regular volume voice about this now, which is the the lining in the sil- the, the silver lining in the cloud. Yeah. Well, before we jump into Fatima, um, I've always been curious about this alleged prophecy of Pope Leo XIII and the vision he saw. And there's a hundred year window there granted to Satan. Does that begin? When does the clock start ticking? Does that begin in 1884 and therefore end in 1984, which would put us in the pontificate of John Paul II? Does it begin later at 1900 or does it maybe begin um, at Fatima? What's your opinion on that? You're, you're pushing your luck, sir. The funny thing is that, um, that you know, it's kind of like, hey, set of your contests and schismatics, sit down. Don't, don't get overexcited. We're not saying anything that would, would vindicate or justify that sort of rebellion. Um, but, yeah, when does this and, – and some translations of this have 70 to 100 years. Um, hmm. Uh, but but a hundred years is nevertheless valid. Yeah, I would say from from 1884 uh, that 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 the clock would begin running, which would put us 
right in line with a a the suspect time frame in the church when this stuff began to go awry. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's all it's a distinction of degree, not a distinction of kind, because as as you know, this none of this apostasy in the church, which is really what we're talking about, apostasy within the hierarchy, maybe. And the laity. None of it happened at once. And the laity. Apostasy and the laity. Well, apostasy and the laity because causally related to the apostasy and the hierarchy. This is what the teaching office of the church does. Aside from dispensing the sacraments, the church is there to be the, the you know, the crook of, to, to wield the crook of the, the pastors, the crook of the bishops. If the church stops teaching correctly, which is not to say that there's any formal heresy being pushed, this can be a conspiracy of silence, which I, I think is what we're going to end up talking about, a conspiracy of silence to quit teaching the ro- robustly the, the um, firm truths of the faith. But yeah, so 1984, any, any time between 70 and 100 years after that, one sees a, a strong backing away from the voluble teaching of the one faith and silencing certain aspects of the faith. And uh, what I was going to say was um, this didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen at the council, certainly didn't happen in any of the council documents, right, which are all um, dogmatically and doctrinally sound. They're all there's nothing wrong with them. Like I said, schismatics and and said a sit down. This time is not for you. Some of the things you've been saying that have been overlooked might deserve another look. I think that's what we're saying here. But but the bulk of it still no, because things began coming apart over the course of the 70 years, even in the early 20th century, well before the council. Precisely. Okay, so so are we safe to jump to uh, Fatima, 1917? Sure, sure. Yeah. And, so and, Fatima, and the preface is, the preface is, you know, there aren't that many approved Marian apparitions, when you really think of it. And Our Lady doesn't come yeah. down too often. So when she does come down and give a message, we need to listen. You know, like when she comes to Dominic right. and gives the rosary. I mean, this is a big deal. And so if she comes down in 1917 and says, Russia is going to spread errors throughout the world. I want everybody praying the rosary, etc. That's a big deal. I've also heard it said that the miracle of the sun was the largest attested miracle in human history since the crossing of the Red Sea. Right. That with the greatest right. number of people, I mean, not even the resurrection of our Lord had that many witnesses. So again, right. Our Lady is trying to get our attention. The Holy Spirit want, like we, you know, we talked before, previously about the um, surprise of the Holy Spirit. Well, this is an authentic surprise of the Holy Spirit. Our Lady, spouse of the Holy Spirit, is giving us a message, beginning in 1917, with the three secrets. I'd like to take a moment to draw out the implications of this for all of the the Catholics out there that don't often talk or think about Fatima. What an amazing, amazing boon it was to to the life of the, the Christian, to the life of the faith. Unlike the parting of the Red Sea, the, the, the October 13th miracle of the sun happened and was documented was photographed rigorously, was newspaper uh, covered rigorously by Marxist newspaper men who came out to mock it. You can go get microfiche of these newspaper men, Marxists and Masons running Marxist Mason newspapers all over Europe saying it was 100 percent real. I went to mock. I went to gawk and I came away shocked. Um, I came away with a change of art and I I converted. We know, for example, who was the best hitter in the MLB. We had MLB baseball then, right? Uh, it, was, it was Ty Cobb that year, I looked. It was the modern world. And, and that's the amazing thing. I, I accept as a proposition of faith that the Red Sea was parted, as do you. But that was, what, over you know, 3,500 years ago. That's not as real to me because of the Aristotelian nature of, of being. It's not as real to me as Fatima. Fatima is humongous, right? Because it was foretold to be right after noon. It happened right after noon. 
75,000 people were there and they witnessed this and you can see their faces as they're looking at the sky. And all of the prophecies from the first, second and third secret all came true. And the world believed. And so one, one thing I want to, a one prefatory word, if you'll allow me, that, that bears saying at least once is there's all this controversy that surrounds Fatima, right? And w- what's, what's the third secret? Is there a second half to the third secret? You know, people go to blows over this. It's a major issue in the church. There's something very silly about that. The, the, the ever contrary of the Fatima third secret. What's silly about it is that the sane parties on the other side who are saying that we need to have another look at the third secret, there's a little more to it. Like, I don't know, Cardinal Burke, right? Are what they're really pointing up is Mary said exactly what they're saying was the, the other hidden content of the third. She says it at Akita. She says it at La Salette, another one of the church approved uh, apparitions. She says it at good success in the year 1610 in Quito, Ecuador. So it doesn't really matter all that much whether she actually repeated it for a fourth or fifth time at Fatima, right? Why has why have certain churchmen in the church, not even all that many, guys like Cardinal Bertoni and Cardinal Sedano, who were mentioned in, in uh, Archbishop Vigano's letter, tell-all from a couple of weeks ago, why are these, have they been committed to, for the last 18 years, uh, a narrative that denies categorically that there's any more bit of the third secret, no matter how much circumstantial evidence there is. And there's quite a bit. Why? It, it's strange, right? The church has already approved Akita, right? There's all this speculation that the, the unrevealed part of the third secret is just the exact same as Akita. Allegedly, Cardinal Ratzinger said this a couple different times. Other people call Our Lady of Good Success Our Lady's insurance policy because it says precisely what these crackpots are alleging the unrevealed part of the third secret is. So that's the question. The answer to the question is this. To a Christian, it shouldn't matter, right? Because all of these are other church-approved apparitions, and we know that they're true, and there's a lot of solid, solid reasons to believe them. To non-Christians, the attention of the world was gathered. I'm talking New York Post, Washington Post, LA Times, um, papers all around Europe. They had a fixed attention, a fixed eye on Fatima. And if this apostasy in the church, which... So we come right out and say it, apostasy in the clergy, apostasy in the laity in the later half of the 20th century, which repeats itself at time and time and time again um, in Marian apparition. If this is truly what's at stake, the only reason these churchmen are hesitant to publicly acknowledge Fatima is because of its public nature, is because all of the world was transfixed with Fatima. No one ever gave a damn about Akita, even within Catholicism, barely anyone knows what it is, right? Or Our Lady of Good Success or Our Lady of La Salette. So it, like I say, there's no need for scandal. There's no need for hand-wringing, um, except from the politicking point of view of, of the very f- small number of people in the church that might have actively sort of covered this up. It's sort of not a cover up on the other hand, but the, 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 the point is it's, it's been repeated time and again. So what you're saying is whether or not you accept that a third secret of Fatima has been revealed to the world, we can still get all the data we need from Akita, La Salette and Our Lady of Good Success. That's right. That's but right. isn't that offensive That's though right. that, that the number one, the most public, the most miraculous of all the Marian apparitions, the one with the most public display, is the one that's getting hushed up. And then there's this huge controversy, I'd like to touch on it, if you're okay with it, on the third secret of Fatima and whether there's a, they call it the fourth secret of Fatima, that's Sochi's term, isn't it? No. It is. I don't it like is. that term. Yeah. yeah. I like calling it 3A and 3B. 
You know, so like the first, yeah, the first secret of Me Fatima too. was Our Lady showed people falling into hell, and then after that, she explained to them why people go to hell and how we need to pray for poor sinners. So there's a one A and a one B. There's the vision you see with your eyes, and then there's the auditory explanation of the vision given by Our Lady's voice. And so the idea is in the third secret, there's the vision of the bishop in white and the cardinals and the bishops and the nuns going up the hill, and then they all get killed, and then that's it. Our Lady doesn't tell us what that means. It's a very confusing vi vision, especially since it's a bishop in white. It doesn't specifically state it's the Pope. And there's all this speculation that, in fact, not speculation, but witnesses who had access to the third secret that said Our Lady actually explained what those visions meant in the third secret. So maybe touch on that and, and I don't know, maybe reference Sochi as well. Yeah, that's really important. I, I'm, I like the way you set it up, Dr. Marshall. It's that here, here's what's non-speculative. Sorry, you, you know, whether you're on one extreme of this you know, Catholic answers who have who have rigorously said that there's no, you know, you're like believing in spells if you believe there's another part to this or the other extreme, like the set of Acantus. I, you know, I take a nice Aristotelian golden mean with respect to it. And so does Sochi. I mean, I, I largely do because Antonio Sochi lays it out so nicely. Here's what's undeniable. Like you say, there's one A and one B. So much, it, Our Lady was so methodical in the way that she she gave um, a graphic component to each of the three parts of the secret, and then an auditory component that she she stuck through it with. She showed the kids a vision of hell, which is totally obvious that it was hell. And then she says, "What you've seen is a vision of hell, where the souls of poor sinners go." Blah blah blah. She says a little bit more. Then she gives the graphic uh, visual component of the second secret, which involves a consecration, two world wars. Um, and then she gives to be an auditory component of, you know, look, if you don't, if the, Pope, if the Holy Father doesn't make this consecration of Russia, who the little kids, all three of them who are illiterates, thought was a faithless woman, by the way, they didn't even know Russia was a country. If, if this consecration of Russia is not made, then all of these things will happen. You know, uh, Second World War will break out and Russia will spread all her errors, feminism, Marxism, all this bad stuff all around the world, which has obviously happened, like yeah. Peter Kwasniewski always says. But when it comes to the third secret, we have in several ways verified that there must be uh, an auditory component, not just the visual component, because one, internal consistency demands it. Secondly, we have the third and the fourth memoirs of Sister Lucy herself. Get this. So all three of the, the seers were not equal. Sister Lucy was the eldest, and her two cousins, boy and girl, Francisco and Jacinta, were, I think, six and seven, uh, about to be seven and eight. And she was nine. Um, and Francisco, we don't know what he's done. There's a little bit of uh, uh, juicy soap opera element here, but... He was in a state of sin at this time. And Sister Lucy gives us this detail. So in terms of the senses, he could see Our Lady, but he could neither hear her nor talk. This becomes very, very important um, when we talk about the third secret. Jacinta could see Our Lady, hear her, but she couldn't speak herself. Only Lucy, the eldest, the cousin, the one who would survive a long time thereafter and be the, the, the lone surviving seer, could speak and see and hear. And this is important because Lucy recounts, and I forget whether it's her third or her fourth memoir, crucially, she said that she herself had to ask Our Lady whether or not she, should, she could share the, the secret and with particular regard the third part of the secret with the words of the Virgin with Francisco, because Francisco could not hear because he's in a state of maybe mortal sin. Right. Why does this matter? It's a slam dunk because it verifies what you are using internal logic just to show. 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, there must be a 3B. Yeah, there's no um, words. What, what was released by the Holy See 
has Zero no words. words by our lady. It's just a vision right. that is very complicated. I don't see how that vision helps baptize Catholics or clergy or popes in the world. There has to be an instruction attached to the climax of the three secrets. Right. Uh, without a doubt. I mean, but that's the slam dunk. Unless Sister Lucy is making this whole thing up in her third and her fourth memoir, there are zero words presented by Cardinal Bertoni in 2000, whereas she literally had to ask Our Lady, can I share with her your words about the third secret? That is what we call at law a slam dunk. Also, there's this very, very overlooked interview um, it was uh, dispensed by Pius XII. He sent a priest named Father Schweigel to interview Sister Lucy in, uh, in two, uh, 1952. And here's, here's what happened at this interview. Um, so it was September 2nd, 1952. Father Schweigel comes back and reports to Pius XII. And again, this is sometimes controverted, sometimes not. Uh, the third secret has two parts, he says, which is what, what anyone with half a brain knows anyway. One is about the Pope, which is the revealed part. The other part refers to the words in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc., which, again, there's no mention of that in the revealed part of the secret in 2000. And we know that's part of it, again, from Sister Lucy's fourth memoirs. Um, so one part deals with a Pope with sometimes they say uh, evil eyes, but the other part concerns the dogma of the faith. And Father Schweigel says, and I must say nothing specifically. That's the real secret is the second part. Right. And I must say nothing. The dogma of the faith will not be preserved, obviously outside of Fatima, which means Rome. And I must say nothing now. Uh, so yes, there, there were two parts. Also, there are two letters that were sent. Um, when the when the bishop of um, no I don't think I think it's the cardinal primate of Portugal sends over the letters of the third secret containing the words of the third secret they're sent over in two letters uh, John Paul II the Vatican reports that he read one of the one of third secret A the day after he assumed the papacy in 1978 they say he assumed secret three B though they wouldn't admit that it's a different secret uh in 1981 the day after he was shot so there are which was secrets. by the way may 31st may, may thir right yeah 13th. he was shot i'm oh, sorry sorry 13th yeah, 13th may 13th yeah. was the day that that pope john paul ii was shot right of course fatima day yeah. when, when else would it happen right if it doesn't happen may 13th it's going to happen october 13th but but yeah so basically you can confirm and this is all non-speculative this is all Pius XII related, he sent over this emissary named, named Father Schweigel. Um, earlier in his life, he had said, um, it, we, we don't, this remains a mystery. In the early 30s, before he was Pius XII, he said, there's this famous quote, he says, and I quote, I'm worried by the Blessed Virgin's message to Lucy of Fatima. This persistence of Mary, which does not appear in any of the published part of it, by the way, this persistence of Mary about the dangers which menace the church is a divine warning against the suicide of altering the faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul. I hear all around me, says young Pius XII, innovators who wish to dismantle the sacred chapel, which happened, destroy the universal flame of the church, which happened, reject her ornaments and make her feel remorse for her historical past. A day will come when the civilized world will deny its God when the church will doubt, as Peter doubted, she will be tempted to believe that man has become God. I mean, stop me when any of this sounds new, given 2018's events. In our churches, Christians will search in vain for the red lamp where God awaits them, like Mary Magdalene weeping before the empty tomb. They will ask, where have they taken him? So Pius XII always had this preternatural connection to the third secret. I don't know where he wouldn't have read it before he was pope. So I don't know where he got I don't know what words he was reading when he said this back in the middle 1930s, but definitely by 1952, when he sends his emissary, Father Schweigel, and he confirms there are these two parts, and there are two letters, the third secret is sent over in two letters, and the Bishop of Lira, Portugal, 
took a peek. He held it up to the light. The third secret, he wasn't, you know, it was in an envelope and he counted 24 lines of text. And what they read on 2000 in May was four pages. And like you said, had no words from the Virgin. So I'm not a crackpot. You can see my head. I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat. These things are incontrovertible. Yeah. So the idea is there were two parts. And in 2000, they were able, with a little bit of mental reservation, they were able to say, we have revealed the third secret. Precisely. Precisely. the auditory, the dictation that Our Lady gave on what this vision means has been hidden. Now, I've been told, I think this might come from Malachi Martin. And I, some people don't trust him completely. But in 1960, it was opened in red with two Portuguese translators in the presence of John the 23rd. You familiar with that story? Yes, uh, somewhat, yeah. So, so tell us about it. You probably know it better than I do. I'm not sure I do, but yeah. So there are these there are these two translators, and there were... There were, I think there were parties besides just John the 23rd. Yes. John the 23rd, by the way, will end up saying, the third secret does not concern the years of my pontificate. Yeah, he says this is um, not for this time. Not for this time. And has it sealed. Which, which contra- it will remain up forever under permanent seal of the Vatican. Now, this go another, another very difficult to ascertain, in fact, is whether or not the 1960 dead date, so to speak, was Mary's herself our ladies or lucy's and yeah, because it, it she becomes, says it must be opened by or on 1960 what's the or is that the earliest or the latest right. when you can open it uh it's hard the jury's out i've researched this it's something fishy I, i'm not trying to sidestep mm-hmm. um the the two translate portuguese translators and all that but it, it's fishy that it's very very difficult to ascertain that the, the reactionary allergic sort of you know, with all due respect, Catholic Answers response to this has been, oh, the, that was just Sister Lucy's uh, deadline, and she can she can change this around as as she needs. She can do it as she sees fit. Mary, you know, the, Mary would never set this deadline because then that would have been the churchmen disobeying Mary. But but lots of lots of smart people on the other side say it's Mary. Um, it, it, Sister Lucy, I think, at one point makes it sound more like it was her her own her own deadline. Nevertheless, it was strange. Remember, Washington Times came out with a story in 1960, Washington, po- uh, Washington Post. They were all going nuts. Why would you not open this? And, and John the 23rd says, because it doesn't concern the years of my pontificate. Now, yeah, I think a lot of this does come from Malachi Martin, who's less trusted. But some of it comes from Gabriel Amorth, who's more trusted, generally speaking. And, and being Gabriel uh, Amorth being... Exorcist of Rome. Chief exorcist. Done more exorcisms than anyone in the history of exorcism. And he was like BFFs with Padre Pio. And he says that Padre Pio swore to him that the third secret had not been, uh, would not end up being fully revealed because it was, you know, apostasy in the church, really almost like an an anti-church. I mean, this is Padre Pio, right? So, so Padre Pio obviously has not read the secret. He's getting this from some sort of divine inspiration. Yeah, that yeah. that he leaves unclear. But, right. but I, yeah, Padre Pio wasn't privy to the secret as far as the the parties there that we know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I don't. I've never. So seen he told that. Gabriel Amor, "Hey, the secret is not going to be revealed." Because it has to do with apostasy in the church. He said it wouldn't make sense to, to do. I mean, it, that would be like if, if you're on the board of regents and you're given a secret, uh, you're given what would be a revelation to all of the shareholders saying, hey, the board of regents are many of them, not all of them necessarily, are embezzling money. And you give it to me and let's say I'm one of the bad guys, theoretically, mm-hmm. I, I mean, am I going to be apt to share this? Right. Even you know, even if you're a good guy, it's going to be hard to share. Right, which is what so Sochi makes this argument about. He he argues against the the trads, as we say, the hardcore Fatimists, 
Um, even though he accepts many of their premises, I'd say most of their premises, Sochi is not a hardcore trad. He's not a hardcore fatimist. He says, you guys have a lot of the right ideas here, but you're being too hard on popes like JP2, Benedict, who's really the guy behind the guy in all of this stuff. Um, because at, after, after this mental reservation was made, to borrow your, your term, Dr. Marshall, after the re- mental the reservation The one in 2000? You mean the one in 2000 when they released it? Well, the one in 1960, okay. where, where there were mental reservations made, a, an anonymous Vatican source says it'll probably never be revealed, and then they later said, no, we never told that anonymous source that it would never be revealed. So they're playing, the whole thing's become a political football, right, for the reasons already adverted to. And then, yeah, major mental reservation in 2000, and uh, ironically, that's still JP2 and Ratzinger, that the pontificate was so Why long. would they do that? Why, why not just not release it? I don't know. It doesn't I, make, I, I mean, it doesn't make sense. That part, I don't know. And then I also when they released it, and the commentary said that this refers to John Paul II being shot May 13th, 1981. That was included in the when they published it. It's like, no, that's not what the vision describes. No, some 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 guys, uh, John Venery, uh, uh, God repose his soul, uh, a good man who recently died. He would go. He had a habit. Of, he would go into a room. He would read the release third secret as it was released in May of two thousand. Then he would read uh, some sort of like police report of what happened to JP two on that day. And he would just be silent. And literally it would always draw the same consistent response from the audience. Just laughter. It, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't fit. Um, at, though at least they're respecting our intelligences enough to say, okay, it involves a Pope. Here's a Pope. Um, it involves the Pope being shot. Now he's getting shot by arrows and by multiple masked men. And there are dead bodies all around him. He was, of course, shot by one bullet from, uh, you know, one assailant. No one's dead around him. And it, it's, it's not much of a match, but it's a better match than it is a conceptual lineup with the idea that irrespective of whether Mary or, or Sister Lucy set the date of 1960, that is controverted. What's not controverted is that the year of 1960 was chosen by one of those two parties because it would be clearer. It would be clearer. The meaning would be clearer in 1960. How in the heck would a 1981 assassination attempt on the Pope on May 13th be any clearer in 1960? Now, what what would be clearer in 1960, one has to ask oneself. There is modernism, heresy... Yeah, demands, demands for liturgical change, etc. All that was everywhere in the air in 1960. Right, right. Primary topics in the church and, every, and all over the world. Right, yeah. right. You know, one one quick word on Malachi Martin. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I I have a couple friends that are reading Windswept House right now. I'm reading it right now. Are you reading it right now? Yeah. Okay, so I have three three friends uh, <laughs> that that are reading it right now, and. There, there's a lot more to it than just he's some crackpot the way the Netflix special on Malachi Martin makes it sound. I, I no longer believe he's a total crackpot. But there are all these... Wait, is there a Netflix voices. special on him? Or, seriously? There there used to be... I oh, don't know wow. if Netflix put it out, but they published it. And okay. It would always come up under my queue, which is probably based on my search histories or whatever. <laughs> but it was on Netflix for many years, and it just makes him sound like an adulterer. He left the priesthood. He, he had a special dispensation. Um, so technically, he never left the priesthood. Um, and he's, he's what, what is he talking about? Uh, it's just all the modernism that has crept into the church. Satanic black masses. Yeah, I mean, it goes beyond modernism. It goes into, if Malachi Martin is to be to believe, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests, celebrating satanic rites which include right. the molesting of children. Right. That's, but, that's what's being alleged there. Beginning in the 60s. 
beginning in the 60s. That doesn't sound so far-fetched now. I mean, at a certain point... No, after the grand jury report of Pennsylvania was released, and after we hear about Cardinal McCarrick, you know, suddenly Malachi Martin's book, Wins to Left House, sounds like an interesting read. Sounds more like gospel. Now, can I just really... I I know you didn't want to spend too much time on it, but really, as quickly as I can read, can I... Can I read Our Lady's insurance policy, what she said in 1610 uh, in Quito, Ecuador? Success, good so success. So give people a background because most people, I'm, I'm not familiar with it at all. So just tell people where this is coming from. So it's a church-approved apparition uh, in Quito, Ecuador from 1591 through 1614 or 1615. She appeared to, again, a, a, very, a very holy uh, religious woman and gave predictions about, get this, the church in the latter half of the 20th century. And it, it's basically just what we're saying about Fatima, kind of like we, we pre- prefigured the whole thing. And it's, it's remarkable. It, it's remarkably accurate when you compare it to what happened in the latter half of the 20th century. So it's, it's a church-approved apparition. I'm not talking about, I'm not a medge head. I'm not talking about Medjugorje right. or any of these crack crackpot ones. This is church approved. And again, they haven't bothered to cover this up because not that many people look into it. But what it says, what uh, I'm going to skip around a bit. Unhappy, Mary says, the children of those times, seldom will they receive the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. As for the sacrament of penance, they'll confess only while attending Catholic schools, which the devil will do his utmost to destroy by means of persons in authority. The same will, uh, will occur with Holy Communion, Oh, how it hurts me to tell you there will be many and enormous public and hidden sacrileges, meaning public sacrileges um, in mass, you know, not handling the Eucharist with proper right. reverence, but private sacraments, as of course we know, so, uh, communion by hand has led to many black masses. The right. only way to really get it for a black mass is to not take it on the tongue. Yeah. In those t- uh, and she goes on, she says, all of the sacraments will be attacked, including extreme unction. I'm not going to read that, though. The sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with the church, will be thoroughly an- attacked and profaned. Masonry, as in Freemasonry, which didn't even exist for another hundred years till 1717, then reigning, will implement iniquitous laws aimed at extinguishing the marriage sacrament. They will make it easy for all to live in sin, destroy the shame culture, thus multiplying the birth of illegitimate children without mm. the church's blessing. The, now listen to this. The holy sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised, for in this both the church and God himself are oppressed and reviled, since he is represented by his priests. The devil will work to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every way, working with baneful cunning to destroy the spirit of their vocation and corrupting many. I've seen other translations that make it sound more like a, a specifically sexual corruption. Those who will scandalize the Christian flock will bring upon all priests the hatred of bad Christians and enemies of the one Holy Roman Catholic Apostolic Church. This apparent triumph of Satan will cause enormous suffering to the good pastors of the church, to the supreme pastor and vicar of Christ on earth, who, a prisoner in the Vatican, strange, will shed secret and bitter tears in the presence of God our Lord. Hmm. Um, There's a lot more. Look into into Our Lady of Good Success. The corruption of priests, oh, and the explosion of the passions in the second half of the 20th century refers indiscriminately. Sexual sexual revolution. Sexual revolution in the 60s. This this is in 1610. How are you going to, you can't write this stuff, right? So it's convincing. It is. You want to say something about Akita? So Akita happens, all this stuff circles the wagons. Akita happens in Japan in 1973, which would be 13 years after, 13 years after the non-revelation of the secret in 1960, the third secret. The seer at Akita is a, 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 a truly a beautiful soul, Sister Agnes Sasagawa, a convert from Buddhism, who is deaf. She's deaf in both ears at the time of the apparition. 
and who regains her hearing in order to hear Mary for a, a period of about six months and then goes deaf again. Again, an absolutely confirmed, uh, worthy of belief, secret, uh, I'm sorry, apparition in the church. And it's, it's beautiful. In this case, it was not a, like an illuminatory vision of Mary. It was a wooden statue. Um, That would cry real tears. They tested it. They did the whole rigmarole. And it spoke like an interior locution to Sister Agnes, who was deaf. The message of Akita is this. I'll read from that. If men do not repent and better themselves, she says there will be a natural chastisement. Malachi Martin also spoke of this a lot and was vindicated by this. But then she goes on to describe a supernatural chastisement, which makes the natural chastisement war or flame from above or whatever it is, pale in comparison. The works of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals and bishops against other bishops. Sound familiar? The late Cardinal Kafara, one of the four dubia cardinals, quoted from this in like his final words Mm. when he's saying, when he's saying, you know, cardinals opposing cardinals. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises. And the demon will press many priests, sounds like good success, and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially, especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. Now, the important thing here is, Every time she appeared to Sister Agnes, every time she appeared to Sister Lucy, Lucy and Agnes both describe her, her bitter tears. Um, and she appeared as a, as a 15-year-old girl to Sister Lucy. She was just the, the weeping wooden statue to Agnes. But why was she so sad? The key is, the key is that when consecrated souls en masse in large numbers, become corrupt and begin to serve directly the evil one from within an apostatized position. They don't leave the priesthood. They're, they're still posing as priests. They can teach false doctrine or be silent about true doctrine. And that is the primary way that souls get to heaven, right? Not everybody's a Mozart. Most people aren't. Most people can't teach themselves the piano. Most people need a piano teacher. That's the role of the church is the, the, you know, ecclesial piano teacher to get people into heaven. When the church largely, or the church men in large numbers abandon their post, most people go to hell. And that's why Mary's talking about most, even more than before. Um, the, the souls fall into hell the souls of poor sinners, like snowflakes in a snowstorm, to borrow Mary's expression. That's why she's crying. She's crying nonstop for this. So it it all works out. It it, it circles in a frightful way, in a a wonderfully frightful way, back to what you said about Pope Leo XIII in the St. Michael's Prayer, like heaven forfend what's coming. Um, People need extra exorcisms because if the church, the churchmen, abandon their posts, then most souls will wind up precisely where the devil, the demon, wants them to go, which is hell. And what's Our Lady of Fatima, Vision 1? Right. 1A, 1B, that's it. Right. Um, So, I mean, if we're going to wrap all this together for people, we've got prophecies that the 1900s, in particular the second half, of the 1900s are going to be a time of moral and dogmatic compromise. People will not seek the sacraments. There'll be children out of wedlock. Marriage will be attacked. They'll by be, Freemasonry. Yeah, by yeah. Freemasonry. Uh, bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal. Um, and then we have, you know, in our own time, the reason why, you know, we're even talking about this is we have these grave accusations that have been levied by Archbishop Vigano um, against cardinals, archbishops, and even the Pope himself, calling 
for a papal resignation. And I mean, I'm sure that there's been, you know, crackpot priests and bishops throughout history calling for papal resignations. But the fact that we're living in that time now where things have become this grave uh, and this extreme, it kind of begs the question, um, what is that third secret stating with regard to the vision of 3A and Fatima? And I've pondered this myself with other people too, you know, is because she says it's the Bishop of White. Uh, I think she said we presumed him to be the Pope. Is that the word right. she uses? Yeah. So it's right. not necessarily the Pope. Um, and he's surrounded with cardinals and bishops and they're going through a destroyed city. Um, if you haven't read that, anyone listening, just go Google it. It'll take you, you know, less than a minute to read, I think. Um, but what's going on? There? Is that a good, is that a good Pope? Is that a bad Pope? Are these good clergy, bad clergy? We don't. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it, the vision doesn't submit itself to the kind of ready-made, uh, uh, application that, that Cardinal Bertoni presented. It, it does, like you said, it's not clear. It's, it's the bishop in white is actually all we know. And she says, we presumed him the, the Pope, but, but here's what, what one could say about the vision presented in 2000 with, cert, with relative certainty. It, it involves Sister Lucy's ability to talk and write about all three parts of the secret in the 40s and 50s, the 1940s and 50s. The second part of the secret was that whole nations of on the globe would be erased from the map and that millions would die if the second war broke out, which would happen if Russia wasn't consecrated. And there's some insinuation that she knew Russia, that, that Our Lady had given her that Russia wouldn't be consecrated. So she's talking about the genocide of millions of people. And when she writes and when she speaks about it and writes it down, she doesn't bat an eye. Not that she doesn't care, but this is not the spiritual disaster that she always connected to the third secret. Sister Lucy gets very, very ill in the middle 40s, uh, I think 1944. And her bishop, the Bishop of Coimbra, says, you should write down the third secret in case you die. She never really believed she was going to die, but he was telling her she should do this. So she said, I'll Wait, try. that she was never going to die? Well, that she wasn't going to die before 1960. Oh, before the, she knew, yeah, the release. Yeah, before the yeah, release. yeah, yeah. Endless summer. No, she knew <laughs> she knew she had a, a, a limited run in the sun. Sorry, I misspoke. But um, nevertheless, she said, okay, you're my bishop. That's fine. So she went and she tried to write the third secret. And she reports that she would quake with holy fear and trembling. She couldn't do it for November of 1944, December of 1944, into January of 1945. She simply couldn't bring herself to do it until he gave her an Episcopal order. She said, you're going to have to order me because this is so hardcore. The third secret. Yeah. So it's worse than the destruction of nations. Worse than the destruction of millions of yeah. people. For her. Yeah. For the Pope. Now, you're asking me to believe, again, just subject this to the court of public opinion. People don't talk about this enough. I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat, mm -hmm. but these are facts. Third secret, you're asking me to believe that the entire bit of it is one pope gets shot and survives? In 1981. I mean, you, in 1981? Yeah. And, and that's, she'd be quaking over this, where she, without batting an eye, the second secret is millions of people will die and did die in World War II. Yeah. Get real. Yeah. I mean, that's the only response one can have reasonably. Yeah. And there's no... So, so Sochi, who used to be BFFs with Cardinal Bertoni, who presented this secret, Cardinals Bertoni and Sedano, both of whom, interestingly, were implicated by Vigano. I, I, that's yes. the first thing that jumped out to me. They were. Yeah. They are really the only ones doing anything more than... Oh, and Sedano, by the way, was a protector for Masio Masio. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, this doesn't seem to shake out that... that doesn't matter whether you're a religious sister or you love the Pope. It, it, it was an abstraction for her in 1950. She didn't even know who would be Pope. How in the world can you try to make these two parallel lines meet? They, they never will. It is, it is got, there's got to be more to it than that. And, and if you look at this, uh, Dr. Marshall, um, 
Raymond Bur- Cardinal Burke talks about it, and he does almost exactly what I've been trying to here today. Um, there's a video you should go look at it on YouTube. Maybe we could link to it. Um, he uh, he gave this talk in 2017, where he says, "I want to talk about the third secret of Fatima," and he says, "I don't want to get into all this trads versus Novus Ordo Catholics, Fatimists versus non fatimists on." whether or not the full secret's been, the third secret has been fully revealed. But then he gets into the content of the third secret and what he thinks it means. And none of it bears any kind of meaning on the record because none of it has anything to do with this Pope, or this Bishop in white being shot, right? He says, um, um, basically he says, it, the third secret concerns the diabolical forces unleashed on the world, um, entering the very life of the church, you don't get that from from whatever the visual content means. It doesn't mean that. He also says the third secret was directed particularly to the pastors all the way up, whose failure to teach church teaching equals the worst, gravest form of disaster, meaning everyone goes to hell. You don't get that from, from a bunch of guys mm-hmm. shooting the Pope with arrows. And he also says he, he, he conjures up those words of Paul, Pope Paul VI, who's arguably partly on the hook for this, from 1972, those words saying, through some fissure, you referred to them earlier, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary, and and he goes on about, you know, in 1972, modernism has basically entered the church, and it's in what he calls auto-demolition mode. So, So even Cardinal Burke, you know, one of the, used to be like number four in the church, is saying, look, I don't want to get into all the bickering on whether or not the third secret's been revealed fully or not, but it hasn't. It, it can't have been. Yeah. And, and he also makes some sort of um, makes some sort of speculation about what it means. Cardinal Odie, the the um, the personal secretary to John the Twenty Third, butted heads with John the Twenty Third, and he said, I, "I told him, I'll never forgive you." holiness for not revealing in 1960 what the third secret is. And he later said in an interview in 1990, I would be surprised if the third secret alluded to dark times. I would not be surprised if the third secret alluded to dark times for the church, grave confusions and troubling apostasies within Catholicism itself. If we consider the grave crisis we have lived through since the council the signs that this prophecy has been fulfilled seem to be lacking. And, and this is also the author of Humanae Vitae. So very, very good source. And again, he, he tripped over himself after he said that to say this is not the council's fault, but it's everything that happened before and after the council. So, I mean, I can't help but think that when John the Twenty Third opens that, up in 1960 and has it read to him through the Portuguese translators, two Portuguese translators, that it says something about a bad pope. And so he says, well, this is not about my pontificate, I'm a good pope. And he's a good pope, John, that's where it comes from, right? So that's my my gut take on it. And I've often, you know, I've read the, the 3A, Third Secret, so many times, and you mentioned it just a few minutes ago, about the details of the arrows. Right, they're killed by arrows. Um, there's not many terrorists out there right now that go around with bows and arrows, you know. And usually, no. usually arrows are a sign of pestilence, you know, and of judgment. And so, I don't know. I, there's there maybe there's some some kind of an allegory going on there um, regarding the the death of these clerics, you know, and whether it's a spiritual death or it's an actual physical death in a city in ruins. I don't know. Well, that's a good point. Um, and it's really important because even some of, I think our mutual friends are still loath to believe that, that any kind of interpretation of three, a or three, a with three B, if it exists, um, outside of the one Bertoni offered is like, is like, uh, you know, deuterocanon or, or, uh, apocryphal. Yeah. And that's just not true. This is just, this is just, you know, it wasn't even the CDF in 2000 that presented this Ratzinger. It was, 
it was the it was Sedano and Bertoni who weren't even the head of the CDF. So it was it was um, the undersecretary to Ratzinger, which is an odd choice. And so even if you only believe it's 3A, yeah, it yields itself. It submits itself to allegorical interpretation. It almost demands it, which is what I like about what you're saying. Right. Because it so clearly doesn't fit the, 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 the shooting of John Paul II. Now, maybe on some anagogical level, it also works there. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But like I say, what I'm rushing to reassure our friends who are still skeptical that any kind of doubt is wrong is like, look, even if I accepted 3A is the only secret, it still might have all this allegorical meaning that Padre Pio, Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Odi, right, uh, Malachi Martin, Cardinal Chiappi, who allegedly actually read the secret and sent it, said it meant apostasy in the church. It could come just from the allegory uh, of, of 3A. So we, there's no need for all of us to wring our hands and, and you know, feel guilty over it. That 3A is still very vague. Everyone should go read that part because it's a boon uh, to the life of the church that we've be, been given even that much. Yeah. Right. Go read it and see if that fits what happened in May, on May 13th, 1981. I don't think it does. Do you think 3B exists right now? I, I do. Well, they well, now this gets more in depth, but we know the name of the safe that 3B is being stored in, according to good sources, according to Antonio Sochi and Chris Ferrara, um, uh, Barbarigo is the name of the safe in the papal apartment. See, 3A, they basically are saying, was being stored in the Vatican archives. And 3B, we know from private correspondences by, uh, I'm forgetting the secretary's name, I'm always bad with names, was being stored in the papal apartment in a wooden safe called Barbarigo. And so, yeah, I think it still exists. I mean, I think it's it's not like you, you might think it would be shredded or fired or something if they want to hide it. But I don't really think there are that many churchmen that, that actively sought to cover it up. I think it was a mental reservation. It wasn't fully because they, they did present part of the third secret. It's still there. No one wants to be the one to shred it and, and right. you know, get a lightning bolt thrown at them. <laughs> we know they, John Paul II read it, correct? The 3B. Definitely. Yeah. Because he read the definitely. 3A when he was first became Pope, and they had a 3B after he got shot. Is that, is that correct? That, that's yeah. right. Now, that's do right. you think Pope Benedict has read 3B? Yes. Well, yeah. well, Benedict gave this famous interview in 1984 with uh, Jesu magazine, Jesus magazine, and he says some really, really interesting things. Um, firstly, he says that it concerns the dangers to the life of the faith um, in 1984. And, and he says, and therefore to the world. The, it, it, you should just go read the interview. It's, it's really dynamite. It was actually redacted from the book. I have the book at home called The Ratzinger Report. Mm -hmm. They pulled it out of there, but you can still go see what he said in this interview. Why would they pull it out of there? He's extemporizing on what must come from 3B. Again, too specific, too much about apostasy within the church, attack on the church from within to have anything to do with 3A, unless he's like the best you know, reader of signs in the history of mankind. And he just he says, look, this is you know, these are the dangers on the church in the world. And you just can't extrapolate all that from from 3A alone. So, yeah, Benedict is CDF for John Paul II would have anyway. But he, he gives this interview in 1984 to, to Jesus magazine. And it's it's kind of dynamite. So you think Circum you think in 84 Ratzinger had also read 3B? Yes. Presumably with John Paul. Presuming that it exists, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah okay. he, he would have. And so, and do you think that Pope Francis has seen three B? I have. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Do you? Would, wait, was it was it Malachi Martin who made the claim, the outright claim that Ratzinger told him that three B is just what I read you, the secret from Fatima, which is always what I've suspected. 
Was that Wait, Malachi Martin? Say that again. That, that Ratzinger said what? I think it's Malachi Martin said that Ratzinger told him personally that Secret 3B was just identical to the Secret of Akita, right. which makes Apos- a lot of sense. Apostasy and, and strife, internal strife Apos- in the church. Apostasy in the church going all the way to the top, whatever that means. Um, right. It makes a lot of sense. It's 13 years after 1960's third secret wasn't revealed. It's 1973, Roe versus Wade year, the, the sexual revolution's in full swing. And yeah, Akita, again, to, to bring this around full circle, whether or not there is 3B and we're just wrong with all of this strong circumstantial evidence, who cares? Akita is church approved and it says that there will be apostasy in the church going all the way to the top. But I, I thought I thought you might have read in Windswept House uh, from by Malachi Martin that this is what no. Ratzinger had said. I, I think I think he I said that. that. I forget who reported that. Yeah. So, why did Pope Benedict resign if he read it? If there is a three B and he's read it, why would he resign? It doesn't make any sense. No, all this stuff stops making. I, I mean, there are some serious. I mean, I want to be, choose my words care, very carefully here, but there's some serious powers and principalities at work when it comes to these most dire, most crucial secrets. I mean, remember who's who's the the ultimate ideological agent behind all of this work here, right? It's it's consecrated souls from from good success that have been corrupted will do the work of Satan, but it's Satan, and there is some some powerful defenses. Uh, that that have that seem to be protecting a lot of these secrets. I, I don't know who, who that implicates. It implicates Satan, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying it implicates Benedict the Sixteenth. That's not what I'm suggesting. I don't know. That that's the thing. If I'm so lucky as to make it to heaven, I, I this will be one of my first questions. Why mm-hmm. you know why did why did Benedict the Sixteenth retire? You did a great video on it, but it still doesn't explain subjectively in his mind why he right. would allow himself to retire. Yeah, we get all and, the external data points. Right. But you still got that moment where it's like, am I going to go out like Braveheart and just, you know, go out in a blaze of glory and just fix this thing? Or I'm right. going to resign and go into the shadows? And I, I don't know, man. It's, it's real complicated. I, I don't see how how resigning and going into the shadows corrects a problem of such magnitude. Well, it can't. And, and yeah, this isn't a guy that's got, you know, kids and grandkids that people, yeah, people he, like us that have kids and grandkids always have this ever ready excuse. And I, I don't think it avails us either. I think we have to be ready to be red martyrs if, if we're called on. And I want to, you know, that's the ultimate example for your kids. But we have this ready-made excuse of, well, I have kids and grandkids. This is a churchman, a lifelong churchman in his 80s. You know, why, why not just red people martyr say, people yourself? People say, you know, on the comments of that video I did, you know, they're like, oh, well, there were death threats, death threats against Pope Ben XVI. Yeah. Uh, you're, a, you're a celibate Catholic priest. You're a pope. You're of that age. You know, you're, you're not going on any, like, fancy vacations at this point. I mean, there's... N- Tahiti is not happening. Like there's not much, you know, left in this life. Yeah. And no. everything you've done and every mass you've said has been a down payment towards the ultimate sacrifice, whether it's martyrdom or white martyrdom or whatever. I mean, I guess right. always, it's easy for us to say that sitting here on our computers, but it just seems that yeah. if this is the problem and it's this deep and you've you've been privileged to read Everything there is on Fatima and a 3B, full secret of, of the third secret of Fatima. I don't know. Okay, so people are interested. They've been, they've been hearing about, uh, you know, Pope Leo XIII and they Fatima and Our Lady of Good Success and Akita. What is a good book to begin with? You know, I just want to also say there's a lot of bogus stuff on there in Marian apparitions, Medjugorje and all that kind of stuff. I'm not promoting yeah. that at all and i would also like to say if you haven't read the entire bible old testament new testament don't spend a whole lot of time chasing marian apparitions god's already given you a lot of infallible inspired words in scripture so be a student of scripture first 
That being said, if you are a student of Scripture and you're reading the New Testament every day, where do people go to get some good info on Fatima or Akita, maybe? Yeah, the best, the best book on the third secret that's the most moderate, even-handed tone I think that's out there is, is um, Antonio Sochi's book, The Fourth Secret of Fatima. He takes a real nice yeah. kind of middle position between the so-called Fatimists, who he largely vindicates, but these are more SSPX types that, that some of the more extreme among them um, have posited like two Sister Lucys and a fake right. Sister Lucy. One, I mean, it gets it's 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 not red pilling. It's it's fake red pilling, which yeah. is a uh, is not a rabbit hole at all. It's a squirrel hole or something. But so he 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 pulls away from from some of them, but some of the more shrewd ones like Chris Ferrara, the secret still silenced. He, he pulls a lot from, and yeah. So that that book is exquisite. Yeah. Before you read it, you have to know a lot about. Fatima itself, you know, it's, it's not for a beginner to, oh, what happened with the, the six apparitions, you know, May 13th through October 13th of 1917. It's more, more for someone that knows what happened at Fatima. And it, the book articulates really nicely why there are, um, indisputable facts from which deductive logic would say there must be three B. Um, so he, he doesn't go off on a lot of uh, um, wild goose chases. He's just saying stuff like I said about, um, you know, Francisco couldn't hear according to Lucy and, and mm -hmm. Our Lady specifically quoted her own words and open up the quote for, for Lucy to share with Francisco. That's pretty hardcore stuff and it's not too speculative at all. Yeah. So that's that's a book I read uh, over the summer. I was like, on Catalina Island, and it, I was just it was a page turner. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I read it several years back. Oh, you read it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I can't. I remember. I just remember that's where I got the whole idea. Three A, three B. He calls it the fourth secret. I don't really like that because Our Lady said three secrets. So right, but it's a catchy right. title. It gets your attention. It's catchy. It does its job. And hey. Even he admits what I like about Sochi is he admits like I'm not claiming I read it. I'm not claiming I'm, I interviewed a cardinal who read it. It's just here is the courtroom of public opinion. Here are indisputable facts. These seem to require this. I technically could be wrong. I don't think so. I, I, I tend to right. like that approach. I think I think the typical Catholic who, that's never heard a lot of this stuff will like that approach. And he's just he's he's Italy. Even when I lived in Italy in 2007, he was like Italy's best, most even-handed conservative Catholic public commentator. Really a smart guy. Lost his friendship with Cardinal Bertoni over it. He set out to write that book, by the way, to prove his friend Bertone, Cardinal Bertoni correct. Wow. And to shut, up, to shut up all the Fatimists, he had a conversion as he, as he wrote. So that's, wow. that's convincing stuff. That is good. Another book that I, I read a while back that I liked was a book by William Walsh, Our Lady of Fatima. Are you familiar with that book? I'm not. It's been so long, far back that I can't remember if there's anything objectionable, but it was published in the 50s. Um, but I think I found that as a really good intro to Our Lady of Fatima. So there's that book too. It's just called Our Lady of Fatima by Walsh. And uh, Fourth Secret of Fatima, that's a good one as well. So, well, good. This has been a good... Um, I don't want to say an intro because we did get into some deep stuff and a lot of the things we said kind of assume that you know a lot about, you know, 20th century church history and, and Marian apparitions. Um, but it does give a taste for everybody to realize that this is not a giant surprise. Controversy in the church, doctrinal controversy, liturgical controversy, and now we're really seeing moral controversy as high up as the Cardinals um, is not a surprise. This... This pot has been brewing. This witch's brew has been brewing under Satan's or over Satan's smoke for decades, if not a century. And it's been prophesied by popes and by Our Lady. Take the final word. Yeah, a, a couple closing thoughts. One, no one's face should be challenged by this stuff. No. That is, I think, a false flag. 
a, a false yeah, reason. Our Lord, not someone told to me, how can you believe Christianity is all these false shepherds? I said, the founder of Christianity said there would be false shepherds. It's part That's of the right. package. If you're That's a disciple, right, right. if you believe in Jesus, you believe in false shepherds that they exist. It's just right. part of the Christian deposit. That's exactly right. But more than just that, even, I mean, these things, the, the priesthood would be corrupted. Um, diocesan priests in particular would be corrupted. That was a prediction from 1610, Our Lady of Good Success. And it would be the religious orders that saved the church. That, that was part of it. I don't think I read that part. In the second half of the 20th century, and it would take you know a fair amount of time for it to get turned around. That is remarkably specific. That is St. Paul saying, don't despise prophecy, right? That, that restores my faith. That tells us, yeah, God hasn't abandoned us. He's not the silent one. He, he'll be there for us. This should bulwark your faith. I, I think it's really odd when people give that response. So do you, evidently. But yeah, in one, one final aspect of the way that, that Leo XIII and Pius X knew about all this stuff was because there were all these intercepted documents that, that we've talked about before, like the Alta Vendita, the Confessions of AA 1025, that were saying, look, this is what the attack's going to be. The attack from outside doesn't work. The only attack that works and has ever worked by the devil on the church is from inside. And let's face it, the church doesn't have the, the vetting process that the Central Intelligence Agency does. So it, it jives with your faith. It should be restorative to your faith in a time of a largely corrupted priesthood, as more and more of these headlines break. And it also jives with your common sense, because when the prophecies were made in the 1800s, when the intercepted documents were made in the early 1900s, they didn't have the luxury of history. We have the luxury of history to look back in retrospect and say that's exactly what happened almost to the T, exactly as it was supposed to happen. It's, it's convincing stuff, and no one should leave the church over this stuff. People should come back to the church over it. We need to fight. We need, to, we need a street we need fight. To fight. We need to fight. And I don't, it's not an excuse to not get the bad blood out. Get every drop of the bad blood out, even if it, you, you have to bleed the body dry. I don't care if yep. there's 17 faithful men and women left in the church bleed the body dry of all the bad blood jesus said will there be any faith left i hope so whoever's true will be there if it's 17 fine if it's 17,000, fine pope benedict said this with his prophecy about the church in 2000 there's no excuse to that that you or any of the people who are doing good work on the catholic internet catholic podcasts you're not leaving plausible deniability to, to say about such prophecies anymore. Well, we should hush this up because it'll scandalize the faithful. No, we don't buy that anymore. No. The faithful want the truth. The truth sets us free. And it just condemns the people that yep. it condemns. And yeah. Mary wants us to know the truth because the truth is her son, Jesus. And the That's truth right. will set us free. So we cannot fear the truth. So, all right. Well, Timothy, thanks so much. Your book is Catholic Republic. The subtitle is? Why America Will Perish Without Rome. It's becoming a burgeoningly <laughs> difficult claim to make, but it's still true. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. If you like this, please subscribe. Please like. You can also listen to it on Spotify or on iTunes. Please leave a review on iTunes. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much. God bless.